and for some reason it keeps transcribing this. So let me just stop that really quick because that gets really distracting. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to drop those in the chat and I will make sure to get to those and address them as quickly as possible. Um, you can also use the raise your hand function on unmute as we kind of go through the information presented today. Uh, the first thing on the docket is going to be our uh, update on data for the day and for the week. So I'll do a quick screen share on this. Okay. Uh, so um, overall, as of uh, again, July 20th is when we started reporting for this for this school year. We've got a total of 2,013 cases in schools. This graph here shows you a general representation of where they're coming from, students or staff. Um, as I'm sure all of us are probably aware the majority of these cases are from students and, uh, and most likely from students who have been unvaccinated. If we go down to outbreaks, we have surpassed last year's outbreaks. We're now at 68. Uh, we've done 40 classroom closures in schools at this point in time. A closure only occurs when there's three or more cases. Um, I, I can't remember the specifics of how many the health department has recommended a classroom closure versus how many the districts have, uh, have closed preemptively, but it's been a fairly even split down the middle. Um, I will be getting that, that uh, more, break, more breakdown of that specific data um, on this uh, later. And you should see those numbers reflected and updated in the website. These numbers were confirmed as of 9.30 this morning. And I believe there's another uh, outbreak that we are uh, investigating as well today. Uh, from the main web page, clicking on to school resources. So as you can see, uh, we do need to update this. So you got you got the update before the website did today. Um, that's how much we care about you guys. We want to get you really well informed. Uh, the the health department sanitary measure. Just call attention to this again. Um, I'm I'm not entirely sure uh, how some of this uh, is potentially going to be affected. Um, uh, with the uh, with the upcoming looming date of the of the 29th, I know there's a lot of concern that I've heard not only from from teachers and school systems, but from the general community. Uh, this measure, though, uh, should not have any um, adverse effect from that date because this still uh, requires you and and requires parents to keep positive cases home and to keep exposed close contacts home from from those sites. So, uh, you know, really just be familiar with this, lean heavily on this tool. Um, we're doing what we can on the back end to try to mitigate uh, what's going on with, uh, with the 29th and, and with the, uh, when the governor's law fix officially goes into effect. Um, I will, I'll, yeah, I'll keep you all informed if anything progresses on that. But right now I'm not sure there's much we can do. We do know that there is a pending CDC study that shows the efficacy with statistically relevant data of mandated masking inside of school systems and prevention of outbreaks uh, as related to mask mandates. Um, we're hoping that may make a difference, um, but uh, you never know. Just to kind of go take two steps back, because I, I did see a comment there in the chat on the uh, case update. So uh, for a total, we've got 2,013 cases reported from schools and a total of 68 outbreaks, 40 classroom closures. We have not closed any full school sites at this point in time, and uh, it is our goal to try to keep schools open um, as much as possible. So uh, just a, a quick re refresh on, on those data stats. So again, lean heavily on that sanitary measure <clears throat> to enforce the quarantine and isolation for positive cases and for uh, any close contacts. Um, we updated this quarantine quiz based on feedback that we received in this session last week. So uh, what I'll um, what I'll do is just quickly go over some of these uh, updated updated changes that were recommended by this group, uh, both from Sarita and from other agencies. If you uh, go here, yes, child has had close contact. Next, does your child have any symptoms? No. Next, is your child fully vaccinated? We're going to click no on this one. Uh, does your child have a, a negative COVID-19 test on or after day five after exposure? No, they didn't get tested and they have no symptoms. Next, that should, hold on one second, let me do quick admission here. 
That should give you the correct guidance of returning 10 calendar days. And if we take a backtrack here, yes, and they have no symptoms, they then return after seven calendar days, which would be on day eight. So again, this does uh, reflect the updated language based on what was recommended from this last session. Uh, I'm gonna drop the link to this survey in the chat so that you all can uh, take this at your leisure um, or use it if need be. I know I do know TUSD has got their own one that they've developed. So if you have a tool that you're using, please continue to use so, or please continue to use it. Uh, this is just an extra tool in your toolbox that you can uh, you can hopefully use as you as you interact with parents, guardians, and or school teachers at your site. Um, going back from that quiz here, uh, there's a, a reminder in the schools and childhood care info. You've got your two case reporting mechanisms. We are potentially going to be changing this survey in the next couple of weeks. We will give you two weeks advance notice before this entry changes. We uh, we envision this change to be more user friendly. Um, we have a couple of uh, schools that we're working with to test pilot this right now to make sure that any changes that we make will, will be uh, uh, easier for you to use in your case reporting and will lessen the encumbrance upon what you already are um, doing for case reporting. Um, a lot of that has come from feedback from you all. But again, we will not make any changes without at least two weeks advance notice and plenty of opportunities for training. Um, as well as feedback on how those forms function. If you have a desire <clears throat> to be a, a, a test pilot for uh, this, uh, this potential change, um, please email me at brian.ellerandpeep.gov so that um, I can connect with you and get you, get you the rough draft of this survey so far for case reporting, because we do want to make sure that, if, uh, that this is absolutely something that's going to be easier for you to use than the two existing mechanisms. Um, okay, so that's that. Uh, the last couple of things I want to uh, emphasize are on, uh, first off, vaccines. So uh, we've, uh, whoa, hold on there. Something weird happened there, sorry. Okay, cool, we're back. Um, for, for vaccines, um, we are, ex we, we're, we, we thought, we thought that there was going to be some boosters. Um, we'll know for sure. Uh, well, not for sure, but there, there's going to be an update from the CDC tomorrow that one of our, our vaccine leads is going to be on, which will provide us with the updated guidance to share out with you on the next week session. Uh, it, it, there's, there's a, it, you know, in the past couple of sessions, we've said like mid to late October is when the, uh, the booster could be available for the general public. Right now, it is currently uh, accessible for those with um, pre-existing health conditions for Pfizer doses. So uh, we will we will keep you updated on those dates when they come out. We are really trying to schedule out uh, a, a bunch of vaccine sites at your schools right now for, for two reasons. One is that when the age range drops to under 12, we want to be out in as many schools as we possibly can give as many opportunities to parents, guardians, and uh, students within those settings to get a vaccine um, as, as quickly as they possibly can. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be scheduling those out with you, continuing to schedule them. I know uh, a lot of you are already scheduled sites, and we, we are eventually going to get to a place where we're going to be doing up to five a day, uh, five different school sites a day. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, please keep an eye out for any emails to district leadership to get those sites set up. Um, uh, to, we think that that under 12 may be around November is when that Pfizer authorization emergency use access will, uh, will extend. Um, it is fully authorized for, uh, for adults at this point in time, so that's, that's really helpful. Uh, and again, we'll keep you informed with the booster shots for the broad public availability um, which is another reason why we're trying to get out to as many school sites as possible, because we want to make it really easy for your teachers who are, are wanting that third dose when it comes around uh, to, to, be, to have it accessible and ready to go. Um, if you have particular sites in mind, I know a couple of districts have communicated with me that there's some high school sites that they want to set those up at as soon as those are available and then do kind of like an all district staff event to get those going. 
we'll work with you on setting those up as well. Uh, there are some additional incentives for vaccines that we've been we've been uh, plugging out through the health department. So if there's something in particular that you think your your constituency is would be interested in in terms of an incentive to receive a vaccination, uh, send me a message at brian.eller at pima.gov and say, hey, uh, Brian, we think that this would be an incentive that would really motivate our, our community to get a vaccine at this point in time. All right, uh, testing distribution is next up on the list. So, so far this year, uh, we have distributed a total of 76,312 test kits. That includes the self-test kits and the Binex Now antigen tests. There's two different tests, and I do wanna talk about these really briefly, just to call some attention to that. So the antigen tests are the ones that you have to have a CLIA waiver for at your school site, and those can only be proctored or administered under the supervision of a health aide or a school nurse or something along those lines. They can be self-administered, but they have to be done so underneath that supervision of the, of the individual at your school site. We also have some YouTube videos that can assist so you can you know you can put the the uh, students um, over to the side of the room put the youtube video on and it just shows them how to self-administer the test which takes a little bit of burden off of the uh, health professionals at your school sites to to do so the self-tests are a separate matter um, the self-tests come in in boxes of 12 tests and uh, those tests are packaged two per miniature box that comes within the larger box. So every box that you hand out will have two test kits, which will include two tests in them to individual families or community members that, uh, that you can get those out to. The implied consent that your district will, uh, will be kind of giving to us as a health department is when you receive those test kits, they are intended for distribution out to families or community members that have reduced access to testing for various reasons, whether that's socioeconomic status, transportation access, or various other, other factors. So uh, please make sure that when you get those self-test kits from us, that you, you redistribute those based upon those, uh, those um, parameters. A couple of questions popping up in the chat I'm going to look at here. Do you have consent forms for students who want to get vaccinated, or do parents, guardians have to be with the students? Yes, absolutely. Let me pull up a screen share of those uh, consents really quick. Um, so we have a, uh, a Pfizer <clears throat> underage consent yeah. form that we currently use. And let me just get this copy up as quickly as I can here. Here we go. Uh, we have these in English and in Spanish. Um, this isn't the most, oh, yeah, this is the most up-to-date form. Okay, so with this consent, uh, you can hand this out right before you set up a vaccine site. We can print out a ton of copies of these in English and Spanish for you as well. Uh, we usually do English on one side, Spanish on the other. First, last name, date of birth, age, all that information is really important to fill out. Uh, if, if the parent or guardian is unable to present with the child, we, as long as this is filled out and kind of validated by your district, if you if your district is willing to offer that, and they say yes, this is the parent or guardian of this kid, we can vaccinate that child at the uh, at the event as it happens. We prefer the parent or guardian be present, but at the bottom here, I want to I do want to highlight this part of the form because what will happen is there's either myself or one of my staff from the county or someone from PMG who has the authorization to collect a verbal consent from a parent or guardian over the phone, because there's been situations where, you know, a grandparent brings the child, parent or guardian is not present, but uh, we will we'll call the parent and then get a verbal consent from them over the phone, gathering this information. And we ask a couple of questions just to validate that it is actually the parent or guardian that we're speaking to on, on that call. So uh, yeah, this, is, uh, this is the form that, that we'll be sending out to you all. So I hope that's helpful, uh, Leslie. And well, what I can do is if it's also helpful, I can send you copies of this um, just to get a couple of those printed out as well at your school site. Next question, set up uh, twin students who are supposed to come back because they had tested positive for COVID-19. One student is testing negative, other sister is still testing positive and she was told she could test positive for up to three months. What is the protocol for these twins? Great question, uh, Ms. Pachado. So um, the, the protocol for testing positive is once you have that positive test, 
uh, whether it was onset of symptoms or or uh, date of positive test. Those are the two. Those are the two parameters. Always default to start of symptoms. That's when the start of isolation begins. That's day zero. If there are no symptoms, the individual is symptomatic. The date of that positive test is day zero. You count ten days after that. And it doesn't matter if they continue to test positive, they can return to the campus because there's still some viral shedding going on, but it's not at a level of contagiousness. Uh, for, the other, for the other twin who was exposed, um, the, la the, the last known date of contact that they had to the positive case is when that's day zero of their quarantine. So let's say it was day five of isolation of twin number one. Twin number two was in close contact to twin number uh, one on day five. Uh, they, they effectively quarantined after day five. Day five would be day zero. <clears throat> Go five days, take a test. If there's no symptoms, negative test on day five, that twin number two can return on day eight, which would be seven days after quarantining. Um, and I, I would highly suggest using that quarantine quiz that I dropped the link on to, to walk through those kind of situations. That will be really helpful. Uh, question here from Superintendent Crew: Are more rapid tests available through PCHD? Are anticipating more will be available soon? Absolutely. So we have all of the enrollment numbers updated from this year. Uh, we are continuing to request those from ADHS. As soon as those ship that next shipment comes in, what we'll do is we'll run another percentage-based allocation. Uh, we will notify the point of contact within the districts and say, hey, we have X amount of tests available for pickup in our warehouse and we'll schedule that logistic pickup and delivery. Um, <clears throat> from point of notification to pickup, it's taking about two days on average uh, just to work out the logistical details. So it's it's pretty quick. Um, most districts are under two days. Uh, usually like day of, we say, hey, we've got you know uh, 200X tests available at our warehouse <clears throat> and school districts have been really responsive in getting those picked up. So uh, we'll, as soon as they come in, we'll be notifying you all of the number that will be allocated to your district for pickup. Uh, Leslie Copy will send those to you. Occasionally have a parent threatening of a lawsuit for the school health office because we're quarantining the child per PCHE standards. More importantly, at the moment, the parent refuses to keep their unvaccinated student home. Who is our expert in PCHD would refer the parent to? Healthcare workers need immediate support when we have angry parents that are refusing PCHD process sanitary measure. Yeah, so Nikki, the, the best thing to do is have them call 724-7018. I'll drop that number in the chat. A lot of these parents, especially the angry ones, unfortunately, do not answer the call from the health department when we call for contact tracing case investigation. Uh, we Our numbers have been going up a little bit in response uh, based on the... Um, information I got from Epi the other day, we're still about 40%, and that's a very rough estimate of uh, parents and families that are answering calls from contact tracing case investigation to follow up on appropriate quarantine and isolation guidance. So we need to make sure that um, that parents do answer the phone uh, if they're just flat out refusing to, 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 uh, to follow quarantine guidance. Um, the best thing you can do is cite that sanitary measure uh, and then just just give me a call directly as a district rep, and we can we can work with other uh, alternate methods that assist you as a district in keeping that that child out from a, a classroom if they're positive or if they've been an identified close contact. But the best thing to do would be uh, to 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 keep that burden off your health officers. Is you can just say this is a Pima County Health Department requirement. If you have issues, call seven two four seven zero one eight and talk to the schools team. They can update you on the guidance. It's not a TUSD thing. It's not a, a, a school district thing. It's a Pima County Health Department sanitary measure, which falls under state statutes. I hope that's helpful. Process for when a parent decides that a rapid test is wrong and then goes out to get another rapid test, which has a different result. Uh, yeah, this is a great question, and this is raising a lot of concerns. So the official policy of the health department at this point in time is once a positive test result is obtained, it is a positive test result and will be treated as such, regardless if there is a PCR test that follows afterwards, um, regardless if there is a separate test that follows up afterwards. Any positive test result that's taken will be taken at face value as a positive. I know that's going to ruffle some feathers, uh, but we we uh, we have that um, uh, that was confirmed yesterday in a meeting with Dr. Cullen along with our Epi team. So. That is uh, that'll be the the written guidance for that. We can get that written up and and uh, and sent out to you all as well if that's at all helpful. 
so what we what you can tell the parents when they when they do that is as per Pima County Health Department guidance, uh, once a positive test result is obtained, that that child is positive. Um, the exemptions are for fully vaccinated individual. Or, I'm sorry, no, that's not the exemption. It's for it's for the the um, issue that was cited earlier. If they've just completed isolation, um, they've gone through the full 10 days, and then they merge out to continue to test positive, they can return at that point in time. If twin two is negative and fully vaccinated with no symptoms, they can return to school earlier than on the eighth day. Absolutely. So if someone is fully vaccinated and not symptomatic, there's no reason for them to quarantine uh, or, uh, yeah, so that's helpful. Uh, I will, yeah, Yolanda, I'll give you a call right after this. Uh, welcome, Nikki. Um, Holy crap. Yes. <laughs> uh, Robin Olson, I'll... Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the number. What should we do when that student is already on campus and parent sent them despite quarantine for close contact? Uh, that's that's a that's going to be a district decision to the extent of what you want to um, what you want to do to the extent of the law. Um, I know there's districts that have uh, have called law enforcement and gotten them involved. Um, you know, there's districts that have pursued. Uh, um, we call it restraining orders. Um, we've uh, we've had to do quarantine orders for a few of them. Uh, uh, as far as I know, there hasn't been a district that I'm aware of that has allowed that child, if they were under quarantine or isolation protocols, to remain on uh, or to, to be admitted back into the classroom. They were held in a separate quarantine or isolation area until the parent or guardian came and picked that child up from campus. So um, that that's a that's a district level decision on what the procedures and policies will be in regards to those situations. Can you remind us what the beginning numbers for contact tracing will likely appear as for families to watch for? So it isn't mistaken for spam. Absolutely. So it's either a, it's always going to be a five two area code with a seven two four prefix uh, that, or it'll say Pima County Health Department. Um, I don't know if anyone from Epi is on the call right now. Let me check really quick. No, there is not. But um, Catherine, if you uh, if you know uh, any other prefixes on on that uh, contact tracing number, that'd be that'd be helpful. <clears throat> okay. Uh, last question. Rapid tests available through PCHD. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, let me let me rephrase one more time on that because I was talking about the self tests earlier. If you need the antigen test, which is covered by your CLIA waiver for your district, if you have that, then we have a ton of those still available. So just reach out to us directly, um, and uh, we'll get you the request form to fill out to acquire more of those tests. Uh, reconfirming what day is day zero um, for isolation? That's for a positive case. Day zero always defaults to start of symptoms if the individual is symptomatic. Uh, if they're asymptomatic and they test positive, the day that they took the test is day zero, okay? Uh, for quarantine, which is close contact to a confirmed positive case, the last known close contact with the positive case is day zero for quarantine. So that there is a potential for quarantine day zero to continue to roll. So let's say like, on Monday, I was in close contact to my my uh, my partner who was a positive case. Um, that would be day zero. But then Tuesday again, we were in close contact. That would restart the clock at day zero. <laughs> Wednesday again, we were in close contact because we had the inability to isolate effectively from each other or quarantine effectively from each other. It goes back to day zero again. So that date has the potential to roll based on the last known point of contact with that individual. Let's say that I did effectively separate on Monday. Um, and that was day zero. <clears throat> and then I got all the way to like day five, but then I had close contact again on day five that would restart my quarantine clock on day zero. Okay. So I hope that was helpful, Patty. Uh, yes, Superintendent Kruth, go ahead, please. Hello. Okay, so you got your hand up, uh, Superintendent Kruth. I don't know how you're uh, muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you are, sir. Thank you. Um, 
I w just want to put this on your radar. Um, as we've been in school, hard to believe, nine weeks. I, you know, we started right at July 20th. Uh, we are starting to see students who have been in quarantine multiple times. Uh, and we're looking at what is a sustainable way to quarantine, knowing that the COVID genie is out of the bottle and how are we going to live with this um, for the remainder of the year. Uh, and one, uh, in, in looking around, it appears that some other states are having a test and stay. Uh, Sorry, you dropped off and muted there, sir. I, I heard uh, tests. <clears throat> test and stay from states was where you left off. Yeah, sorry, Brian. Um, can you hear me again? Yep. Yeah. Copy. Um, uh, I just popped it into the chat. Massachusetts is one of those states I, uh, and poking around uh, and has a pretty good protocol. I'm not obviously something we need to act on in the next you know, day or two, but I just want to put it out there for consideration is where, you know, school districts are looking to how to make this process sustainable, it would be nice to be able to add um, an additional option uh, for schools and parents in regards to quarantine. Currently, it's vaccination uh, and close contact, uh, 10 days out, uh, close contact, or uh, uh, seven days uh, return on test with uh, the rapid test. So if, if we could have an opportunity uh, to um, use Tests on a daily basis before the students school is a other prong um, to consider for schools. Um, I, I I would like for that to at least be kicked around and discussed. So, anyways, just wanted to put it on your radar. Yeah, and that's actually really timely because we have this came up at the leadership meeting this morning. Um, so uh, we are, we are looking at that. Um, one of the one of the uh, um, main things that we've really been looking at though is. Uh, um, there's a, uh, there's there's some potential research evidence that's going to be coming out here around masking, um, which will uh, that'll really reduce any of the uh, uh, close contact situations. But um, I, to to kind of get back to what uh, what you were stating is uh, is that the uh, Massachusetts protocol and the test out day of. Um, I think if if that was implemented along with other layered mitigation strategies, uh, that that was one of the things we were talking about when we addressed that today. But we're we're working uh, with partners in health right now, um, and some folks from the CDC on uh, on looking at that the strategy that you dropped into the chat. So it is being kicked around for sure, and I think um, I probably within the next week, two weeks. Um, we're going to have to figure something out, especially with the uh, the looming date of the September 29th coming up here soon. So thanks, thanks for that uh, that um, uh, chat there, sir. Um, and then uh, from Kate Straub in the chat, please repeat. Couldn't hear your last words. Uh, not sure. But could you give me just a little bit more context, uh, Kate? Um, I it could have been in regards to testing or it could have been in uh, the program. And, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so um, there is a, a Massachusetts has got a, uh, a test out the day, um, the day of close contact. Uh, there's a couple of other states that are starting to kick around this idea of reducing quarantine for students um, and how that how that kind of functions. Uh, differently and how there's how there's a different procedure for testing out of quarantine uh, earlier than that. Um, there's a couple of other uh, school districts here locally that have talked a little bit about this as well. So um, Bill is not the only one that's that's kind of brought this up. So uh, we will I, I'll re send I'll repost that um, <clears throat> link that was put in around the testing here in a second. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Superintendent Root just reposted that. Let me pull that up on a screen share too. So y'all can see what that looks like. Uh, <clears throat> quick message from uh, Nurse Wissinger there. A, a potentially helpful PSA would be a reminder through media that quarantine isolation requirements are coming from the local health department, not from schools. This may help defer angry parents and avoid situations that have taken place recently, just a thought. 
That's that's a really great idea, actually. So um, I I have a meeting with comms again today. Uh, so that's something I'll run by them and see if we can get that uh, out for you as quickly as possible. Um, and I think we may actually have uh, a PSA on that as well. So what I, what I can also do is kind of re uh, um, escalate that again and get that moving forward faster. I think once kids recognize they'll be sent home every time they were close contact for 10 days, they will consider about the resistance to the vaccine. A number of kids in my school are now coming to get vaccinated because they don't like getting home, sent home for 10 days. Absolutely, uh, especially for over 12 right now. Um, that's, a, that's a huge incentive for vaccination. It's also a huge incentive for masking too. Because um, if, you're, if you're fully masked and everyone at the classroom is fully masked, uh, the close contact and the positive case, then it does reduce that distance down to three feet instead of six. And that does help reduce, drastically reduce the number of close contacts that get reported from, from your site. Uh, Kathy, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I, I was just going to go back to about the um, having a positive test and then having a negative PCR test subsequently that now we go just by the positive test. Because that's a change from what I was told earlier a couple of weeks ago, but also I think Michelle posted a question a few minutes ago she had a case this week where I think she contacted the health department. Yeah, was, she spoke to, she actually spoke to me directly about that. And um, yeah. early in the week, this is, this conversation was escalated rather quickly uh, in a period of two days. We, we, after doing a lot of uh, um, uh, really thoughtful uh, reflection on that specific case, uh, we, we did, uh, Dr. Colin and the EPI team did come to the conclusion that it's the, the positive test needs to be adhered to when it's issued on the first time, um, re regardless of, of what the uh, what the uh, secondary outcome could be. Okay, good. Now, does Michelle need to do anything, or do we just let it stand the way it no, is now in that case, and going forward, we go yeah, by what the positive it, was? Let it stand for now, and then uh, just going forward, um, use that. That so guidance. once you're positive, you're positive. OK, thank you, sir. Yep. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, Christy, I'll look around <clears throat> for what we currently have existing on that on our uh, uh, our Pima County official YouTube channel. And then um, I'll try to email that out to this group. So I know we're a couple minutes over. I'm going to stop recording at this point in time and, uh, and try to get you.